Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Roland and these are the slides I use to teach MAN 471 Fundamentals of Project Management at International Business School in Suzhou, China from 2017 to September 2019 when I left. In our second session, I was always talking about organizational context because the way an organization is structured and how it looks on the inside, how decisions are made, naturally impacts on the way we are conducting projects in that organization. And at the initial stage, I am introducing the three classic structures that organizational studies have come up with. The bureaucratic structure, dedicated teams, and something in between, the matrix structure. Now, why is this important? It is important because projects are so significantly different from our day-to-day -day operations. So it makes sense. They are differently organized than the whole organization. But this obviously being a temporary organization within the actual organization leads to rubbing points and conflicts between project and day-to-day -day operations, as we will see in a moment. Now, what do we do first? This is the conflict that is obviously arising between these two items. And depending on what kind of organization we are, organizational culture, structure, and so on, that answer may vary. Now, looking at the bureaucratic organization, as the name says, is bureaucratic, orders are coming from the top to the bottom, and very often the back channel of information from the bottom to the top doesn't work properly. Now what we see here is that we are looking at projects being executed through the departmental structure. That also means that if we need information from a different department, we are looking at going through the departmental communication channels on one department right to the top, to the other side of the organization, right down that chain of command until we have the information and then bring it back to the place where we actually need it. And that obviously slows down the whole project process. Now on the upside, we also have the absolute experts on every item of the project. So if we need a marketing expert, we have a marketing expert. If we need a finance expert, we have a finance expert. However, certain types of projects, namely software projects, will struggle to complete in this kind of silo thinking of an organization. And that is why we develop dedicated project teams as an organizational structure. All the projects are gathered in a project team, which is then backed up by a lean functional support at the headquarters level. And that is what it looks like. And we can also see that we will have different kinds of expertise replicated throughout the projects, which means we have an expert for something in project A and we pay another expert in project B. Would it not make sense to centralize certain expertise. Now the extent of the support varies and sometimes these experts will be at the central level and loaned out to the project and other times they will indeed be replicated and since you can't split a person into two there will be different kind of people doing the exactly same thing in different projects. One of the organizations using a project team based structure is obviously Google with project teams, with international project teams all around the world. Now we have seen there are upsides and downsides to both of these structures and the matrix organization attempts to harness those positives from both sides by overlaying a second level of command over a functional organization. However, what it also does, it also copies the downsides and many more. So it needs a long time to establish itself to go from zero to matrix. Depending on the power and importance of the project and the project manager, 
we talk about a weak, a balanced or a strong matrix. The main source of conflict obviously coming from, as you can see here, every single employee in a project now has two bosses to report to, the, their project manager and their departmental head. For example, the mechanical engineer employee number two is now working not only for the head of mechanical engineering and the engineering department, they also work in project A for project manager A and the director of projects. Depending on who is more powerful and how important the project is, this employee needs to balance and prioritize their activities between project and daily operations. As an organization, we need to ask ourselves how important are the projects that we are running. If we are only doing bread and butter projects that are not determining the future of the organization per se, it is of lesser importance obviously than when we are running one or more projects whose ways and woes determine of if we survive as an organization. It is also very important to understand what resources are available and how we can access them within the organization as well as outside of it. Lastly, we need to look at the abilities that we actually have within the organization that we can access through external resources and what is our actual strategy and how will this project complete or not complete our route to fulfilling our strategic mission. Now this is a little exercise I did from one of the project management books that we were using. You work for Barbata Electronics, your R&D people believe that they have come up with an affordable technology that will double the capacity of existing MP3 players and uses an audio format that is superior to MP3. The project is codenamed KYSO, knock your socks off. The questions that we are asking in this exercise is, well, what kind of structure would you choose for this project? What information do you want to have in order to make that kind of decision? Now, we usually gave students a time like five, 10 minutes to think, collate information and then make their decisions. So if you want to stop the video now and come back to it, have a crack. All right, now when we are considering the project, we are looking at how important, how new and different is this project from our daily operations. What is the need for cross-department collaboration? How often do we interact with other departments? How important is that? And what are the external interfaces, namely our stakeholders, who is affected by this? We also need to understand, well, what is the budget for this and when do we need it? One thing we need to bear in mind is, for example, in mobile phone development, is the one company that brings out the new generation of smartphone first will take proportionally more sales than everybody else later on. So that often leads to organization rushing through project developments and as we have seen developing products that are unsafe to use. Despite all the testing and trials, there is no such thing as a product that is rushed through development that works as intended. Now obviously with a more dynamic and more globalized business environment, more organizational structures have developed themselves. For example, Lattice, Circular, Network, Virtually and Boundaries organizations. Taking into account that the modern business environment is very often blurred, highly dynamic and needs to ma a matching structure within the organization to cope with that new business environment. These new structures all have several things in common, namely that they are solution oriented. They are not looking at, we need a structure with certain titles and something. No, we need a structure that actually works. 
And with a dynamic business environment, these new organizations are highly flexible and fluid. On the other hand, they are also extremely lean. You can't pick any kind of item in that organization, take it out and expect the organization to still function. It is possibly a lethal choice if you remove something. In essence, what we are saying is, if we accept that the globalized business environment is increasingly dynamic, we need to reflect that and become a dynamic and result-oriented organization with a matching structure in order to be successful. Now, often we see a mix and match approach nowadays saying, okay, we like this, this is, a, this is useful and this is useful. And at the end of the day, if projects are so different from one another, then we need different types of organization for every kind of project. Not every organization can complete every kind of project. And what we have seen in the past is that organizations that are organized in a bureaucratic structure very often implement the matrix, go from a weak over a balance to a strong matrix. And finally, when projects are the daily ins and outs of the organization, form dedicated project teams in order to maintain their success. A very famous organization that has gone through a lot of structures and a lot of structuring within uh, its own entity is Microsoft. At one point, they were organized in regional centers. At one point, they were organized into product-centered entities. And all the time, the decision makers have to balance between capability and the necessity of the market in order to create an entity that can successfully navigate the challenges of the modern business world. We often considered companies as a fixed entity. Here it stands and that's what it is. However, as much as the world evolves, organizations need to evolve over time. And if they don't, they will at some point become obsolete and go under. We need to understand the organization not only in its structure, but also its ability to actually evolve. And we do that by looking at corporate culture, for example. When we use the term corporate culture, what we mean is the shared norms, beliefs and value assumptions that connect the people within the organization, hopefully working towards the same goal. And contemporary research defined 10 primary characteristics to explain a culture. First of all, we're starting with identification with the organization. How well do employees identify with the organization and its goals? How much emphasis is paid on the teamwork within the organization? How well does management focus on the impact of decisions on employees? Are the units of operation completely separated? How are they depending on each other? How is control exercised through the organization? How risk tolerant is the organization? For example, if your organization discourages any kind of risk taking, you will end up inventing the smartphone by accident, then not using it and transform from the world's number one mobile phone manufacturer to who is Nokia. We can also distinguish several forms of reward allocation. For example, is reward allocated by how long you have been with an organization, how well you perform, what are the performance standards. We can look at how is conflict managed within the organization, obviously also depending on the national implications, the national culture of where the organization is from. Is an organization focusing on outcomes or on following certain processes and rules. And last but not least, how ready is this organization to accept and implement change that is happening throughout the time, throughout the world? How do we do that looking at corporate culture? Well, first of all, we study the physical organization. 
We read about its history, the founders, the important person, the so-called heroes. And we also observe how the people working for the organization act and interact. And then we interpret these stories that make the organization. Very often we can see that there is apparently an organization on paper and an organization in reality. And where these two do not overlap to a large degree or 100%, people will start to be detached from the organization with obvious implications for organizational performance. Or in other words, when employees realize that the organization they have joined is not the organization they wanted to join, there will be a detachment between employee and employer ending up with one side only coming for a paycheck and the other not really being interested in organizational well-being of its employees. Now, what does that mean for us as project managers? We are at the receiving end of all of this. As I said in the first, in the first session, very often the project manager is an external person and it has to deal with whatever is being given to them. The project is giving, the resources are giving, and the corporate culture is also a given. You can't, you can't instantly change that. And the existence of a certain culture can make it easier or much more difficult to be successful in a project. So when you are working in a non-conducive uh, corporate culture, you can work as hard as you want. You will not achieve what you want to achieve. It is that simple. How do we know that a culture is conducive for projects? Well, flexibility and openness seem to be key facilitators. And I can only emphasize number 10 here, open systems focus. If we are not open-minded, if we do not monitor the external environment and allow the organization to change and adapt to that external environment, we will be ending up with a lot of problems on our hands. Namely, the so-called MARTEC law, where the organization develops at a much slower rate as the actual change outside. Now, Martik's law is very often used for technological pro process uh, progress, but it does apply to so many other areas of life and business reality. And why does that matter? Well, all this is not a one-way trip. As I said at the beginning, very often the information flow from bottom to top is not as well developed as the one from top to bottom. In other words, orders are flowing down very well, but the feedback of this does not work because doesn't seem to reach the people that make the decisions. Also, very often you have to be harsh to be nice. And I love using the example of your own education because a professor that wants to be nice doesn't just give you an A. What, what does that give you? It gives you an A, it gives you a degree, but when you realize or when your boss realizes, well, that person doesn't actually know, it doesn't really benefit you, does it? And here is the detachment. We think that in order to be nice, we have to actually be nice. No. Somebody telling you this piece of work is shit and using exactly this word because it is a more drastic word than saying, oh, this is not too good. You see the difference, shit, not too good. Yeah. What provokes a stronger reaction from you? Obviously, the harsher the feedback is, likely it is to be taken in. Now, whether it results in a positive engagement with that feedback or not is a different story. But at the end of the day, be harsh to be nice. We need to be attached to reality or Martek's law will happen to us.
to our career, to our development. If we do not take into account reality, we will be detached from it. And at one point in life, or at one point of this development, there will be a radical readjustment of this. Why do we need to actually look at this? Well, when we see the amount of projects that are being proposed, that are possible for execution, and look at the scarcity of resources combined with the mandate of the market that we need to innovate, we need to choose those projects that contribute to our bottom line and we need to execute them so that they are successful and do give us the benefits that we expect from them. Unfortunately, history tells us organizations are not very good at this. Very often we choose projects that are not contributing to the bottom line, but to the ego of the decision maker. So we need a new functional department that takes the, all this emotion and I want, I like, I believe out of the equation and gives us a factual evaluation of every project so we can make a sane decision about which progress to further and which to stop. Now, what does a project management office do? Obviously, it has in its portfolio of activities oversight of all projects and their selection. Not only on the project side, but also on organizational capability side, the project management office is the place where we can see all the capabilities that we have as an organization. We need to balance, obviously, all the projects in our portfolio to achieve the risk level that we as an organization are comfortable with, that is appropriate for the size and the capability of our organization. And obviously, we need to balance the project portfolio on one side and our ability and capability on the other. Now, sometimes a project will be the best project, but we don't have the capability. Then we need to have another project to develop that capability. By improving communication with all stakeholders in and outside the organization, we can become an organization that is more open and more attached to the reality of the business world and the organization. We need to develop and offer a perspective that takes the whole organization into account, not limited to one particular department. For example, the accounting department will be not will not care very much about the needs of all the other departments. They want to hire more accountants because then the department becomes bigger, more important. But what does it do for the organization? Probably not much. Now, if we can implement this kind of strategic project management office, we can improve the results from our projects over time. Obviously, we are going to learn a lot by having a central department that oversees all the projects and can learn lessons and filter them down to everybody in the organization. Now, in short, what we do, we are tracking projects, we are analyzing projects, we help choosing the projects that fit our strategic needs, we communicate a set of best practices, how we are executing projects to everybody in the organization, and we are the resource center for anything project related. Now, the, one of the important things that I want to talk about in next session is how the project management office is developing, refining, and handling project selection criteria and select projects accordingly. And that is why the PMO needs to be at the strategic level. This is the place where all the information flows should be coming together and also radiate out on the back channel so that there is a constant information exchange between 
all the places that we need to go as project managers. I took out this part of PMO management and a lot of other stakeholder considerations for the module MAN 474, Project Stakeholder Management. Now, in terms of project evaluation and selection, there is an abundance of models. And it is not that much of importance what kind of exact decision criteria you are using, but it is absolutely imperative that you use the same criteria for every single project. Only then can you develop a selection of projects and rank them in their strategic importance and necessity to be executed. The key questions we aim to answer through this evaluation is what does it cost? What is the risk? And in order to do that, we want to quantify both the risk and the opportunity that the project is giving us. So input costs us X, benefits will give us X, and we are using net present value calculations in order to achieve that. There's many ways to evaluate these projects and we need to bear in mind that numbers are not everything. For the next session, please familiarize yourself with different project selection methods and we will go and run through a couple of selections and test them on different kinds of projects. Thank you very much for your attention. See you the next time.